we are live. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Basavaraj. I welcome you all for this KCIPM slide seminar, which is organized by KCIPM Social Media Subcommittee. The slide seminar is being conducted by uh, Newberg Anand Reference Lab. So there are total 10 cases which are presented uh, by the uh, PGs and faculties from the various colleges all over the Karnataka. So before we begin the presentation, there are uh, some housekeeping notes. Uh, viewers on YouTube, kindly keep the resolution at 720 pixel for optimal viewing experience and participate actively by, uh, by uh, uh, questioning, uh, giving a question in the comment section. And uh, the presenters, keep your audio and video mu muted, okay? And uh, uh, except, except during your presentation. Now I welcome Dr. Anant Vikas from uh, Newberg Anand Reference Laboratory, and uh, I'll request him to take over the session. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Basuraj. I apologize for the delay. Uh, we're still uh, having some issues. Our browser is frozen, so I'm not able to see anybody. Just give us a minute. I was just trying to resolve this. Yes, sir, sure. Um, I think we live in a tech an age where even though we are technologically empowered, we are also crippled at the same time. Yeah, no issues. Yeah. Yes, yes. Ah, okay. I think it has decided to wake up. Uh, yeah. Fine. Nice. Okay. So it is fine for now. Let yeah. us just. Uh, can we have the first presenter coming yeah. online? Yeah, Doctor. Uh, uh, just uh, just before that, let me just confirm if I'm able to share my screen because if I'm not able to do that, everything else will go for a toss. I'll just yeah. try it once. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so I go to share entire screen, right? Yes, sir. So I go to. Screen. Share screen and um, no, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry, this is uh, a little embarrassing. Yeah, you press the share, I sir. pressed it, uh, it's going through its process. Uh, in that, what you do is uh, first you keep o PPT open in the background. Uh, we're doing it on Google Slides. So I'm just going to share the entire screen, okay? Yes, sir. You can go ahead. We're getting another laptop as a backup because this seems to be very slow. I clicked on share. It has to come. <coughs> very slow. No, no, I'm getting my laptop. I think that let the presenter start. No, but uh, the person from our side has to be there no, to listen to the presentation. It's taking a long time. Uh, uh, Dr. Basura, just give us two minutes. We yes, get this sorted out. Uh, yes, really sir. sorry. Yes. Should uh, shall I tell the first presenter to start, or uh, should I wait? Uh, just just two minutes. We'll yes, uh, start on the right note. So yes, that, sir, sure. uh, There's no interruptions in between. Yes, sir. Sure.
viewers i apologize for some technical issue and there is a delay just give a two give us two minutes we will be begin the session No. Yeah. ADL. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, try uh, sharing once. Yeah, just a minute. Share screen. Share. Entire screen. Screen one, screen one, share. And uh, open. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine. Now open. I can see. Okay, so it's fine. We'll yeah, start yeah. with this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll, we'll start. Stop sharing. Stop money. Yeah. So. Uh, Okay, let me the charger. 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 This is the charger. I think the first presenter can share the screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Najia, you can start presenting your uh, uh, the case. Okay, sir. I will share my PPT now. Yeah, 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 sure. Is my PPT visible? Yeah, 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 visible. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Nazia Salim, finally a postgraduate from Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute. The slide number given to me is case one. History given is 44 year old. Lady, hysterectomy, 9 centimeter tumor in myometrium invading the cervix. There were three images given. The first image in low power, we can see the endometrial glands and stroma, underlying myometrium, and within the myometrium, an ill defined tumor. On higher magnification, we can see the ill defined tumor which is lying within the myometrium. And the tumor is also seen to be encroaching up to the surface epithelium. On 20x magnification, the tumor cells are arranged in sheets nest and coats, they are highly pleomorphic with, with epithelial morphology. The tumor cells are having abundant clear to eosinophilic cytoplasm with distinct cell borders. There are also thin walled blood vessels noted around the tumor cells. And the tumor cells seem to be infiltrating the myometrial smooth muscle bundles. Also seen are tumor cells with spindle shaped round and oval hyperchromatic nucleus and eosinophilic cytoplasm. Now, in the same image, in, within the tumor, there are two distinct appearances. In the, on the right side, we can see the tumor admixed with areas of extensive necrosis. And the same tumor on the left side, we can see areas of clear and eosinophilic cytoplasm. Now, the same focus, if we uh, go to higher power, we can see the cells with clear cytoplasm. There are weak glandular or pseudoglandular-like pattern. There is also cells which is having abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm mimicking rhabdomyoblast and lipoblast. There is evidence of extracellular eosinophilic hyaline material and there is extensive geographic necrosis. 
multiple tumor giant cells and some of the tumor cells also showing intranuclear pseudo inclusions the peripheral peripheral stromal cells are appear to be decidualized on the image too the similar appearing highly pleomorphic tumor cells with areas of necrosis seen mitotic figures are definitely there and mitosis more than 10 per 10 high power field there is evidence of vascular invasion and on the image 3, there is, we can see the endocervical lining and the tumor encroaching to the endocervix. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, thick walled blood vessels, and perivascular tumor cells are seen. On microscopy, we can see the tumor tissue within the myometrium and invading the cervix. The tumor cells are arranged in sheets, nest, and coats. Individual tumor cells are highly pleomorphic, round to spindle shaped, with irregular nuclear borders open chromatin, few showing prominent nucleoli and abundant eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm. Few cells show hyperchromatic nucleus, intranuclear pseudo-inclusions, multinucleate and binucleate tumor giant cells are also noted. Mitotic figures are more than 10 per 10 high power field. Also seen are extracellular eosinophilic highland material. There is evidence of vascular invasion, areas of geographic necrosis, and the cells are also surrounded by areas of delicate vasculature and thick walled blood vessels. Decidualized stromal cells are also noted at the periphery of the tumor cells. So I would like to go ahead with the, sorry, my PPT is suddenly stuck. Uh, just, is it visible now? Yeah, the, it is stuck at the microscopy. Try moving the slides. Yeah, it is not. Yeah, 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 the cursor is moving actually. Okay. Sorry, it is not moving actually. Uh, okay. Now is it seen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I will like to go ahead with the differential diagnosis of first carcinosarcoma with sarcoma showing heterologous elements and then gestational trophoblastic tumor favoring epithelial trophoblastic tumor and malignant mesenchymal tumor in which I would like to rule out leomyosarcoma, epithelial type with de-differentiation and malignant picoma. Finally, undifferentiated uterine sarcoma with pleomorphic morphology, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. Now for the, uh, sorry, next slide. I'm not able to, ah, okay, thank you. Uh, so for the IHC markers for carcinosarcoma, carcinomatous areas, Paxate, EMA, and CK will be positive. And for sarcomatous, Desmin and Myogen, yes, uh, we would like to know the tumor, whether it is involving the uterine cavity also. And for gestational trophoblastic tumor, for ETT, P63, and for PSTT, it is HPL. For LMS epithelioid type, H. caldesmon, SMA, and Desmin. And for malignant picoma, HMP45, Melanie, SMA, and Desmin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nazia. Am I audible? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma okay, great. That was a wonderful presentation and I think you've uh, covered uh, all the differentials very well in a very detailed uh, morphology description. Thank I'll you. just um, tell you what the IHC findings were. I completely agree with your IHC panel that you've suggested as well. I'll just share my screen. Uh, how do I... Just click on my screen. Share. Share. Yeah, it's Can you see? Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's visible. All right, great. Uh, you go to PowerPoint. Can you? Just um, I show down. Okay, my name is uh, Ashwati, and uh, I'll go through the first case with uh, all of you. So the differentials that we receive are very varied and uh, quite apt for the case that was shared. The most common differentials was uh, epithelial lyomyosarcoma followed by pleomorphic RMS and trophoblastic tumors, just like Dr. Nazia has uh, given. Carcin and all of these that you can see, picoma, carcinosarcoma, and differentiated sarcomas and carcinomas were all part of the differential. So generally, the consensus was that it was a malignant tumor, which was high grade, and the line of differentiation was not very evident based on morphology. So I'll just uh, give you a brief outline about how we approached the case. So. Nazia has described it very well, but I'll just go over it once again. So this was a tumor which was infiltrated, but generally when you look at it, the borders had, it had sort of a pushing margin at the periphery and very focally infiltrated, as you can see here. The other thing was that there were tumor cells which were of varying types, but majority they had well-defined cell borders. They were intermediate to large in size, to no fit to clear cytoplasm. <laughs> And scattered, multinucleated, bizarre tumor cells were also noted. And one important clue that uh, led us in uh, one particular direction was the presence of these stromal cells, which looked decidualized, which was seen at the periphery of the tumor, as you can see here. 
and geographic areas of necrosis that Dr. Nazia has pointed out. And this very peculiar finding, that is the presence of hyaline eosinophilic material in between islands of tumor, which kind of resemble keratinization, if you would like to look at it that way. So based on these morphological findings, our differentials are very similar. The, our top differential was a trophoblastic tumor. And out of the trophoblastic tumor, was it an epithelial trophoblastic tumor, like you said? Uh, the others we did consider, but the difference was that in a placentocyte trophoblastic tumor, the, tumors, the tumor borders are usually infiltrative and the cells have more of an amphophilic cytoplasm. They usually do not show that hyaline uh, keratin-like material or geographic necrosis. Choriocarcinoma was also a possibility, but usually you have that biphase choriocarcinoma, which was lacking here. But there is a variant of uh, choriocarcinoma, especially after chemotherapy, where the syncytiotrophoblast cells kind of disappear and all you have are uh, mononucleated cells. And this could be that because we didn't have any history. This was an outside block that came for review. And we did not know whether the patient had any history of pregnancy, HCG levels, nothing. This was all that we had. So that was still on our differential. Placental site nodule and exaggerated placental site, we didn't really consider because these are very small lesions which don't form tumor mass. Clear cell carcinoma was actually on one of our top differentials because of the clear cytoplasm, but this did not show other areas of uh, papillae or uh, hobnailing that is missing in this tumor. And all the other differentials are very valid and only immunohistochemistry could tell which, uh, you know, which tumor it was. So because we had uh, trophoblastic tumors as our top differential for the uh, postgraduates. Before we progress further, I just wanted to put a single slide on the kind of trophoblastic cells that are there. So trophoblasts have uh, three main subpopulations. There are the two that we're familiar with, that is the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast that we always see. And then there is also the intermediate trophoblast, which has features in between the cyto and syncytiotrophoblast, right? And this is what we are most interested in right now. And the intermediate trophoblast can again be divided into three different types based on where it is located. So the intermediate trophoblast, it is around the chorionic villi, I call the villus type of intermediate trophoblast. The uh, intermediate trophoblast, which is at the implantation site where the villus anchors onto the wall of the uterus is called the implantation type intermediate trophoblast. And that which is part of the chorioamniotic membrane is called the chorionic type intermediate trophoblast. And why we need to know this is because different trophoblastic tumors come from different kinds of uh, trophoblastic cells. So this is something called a trophogram, which I picked up from a textbook. And uh, we, I've modified it based on the IHC markers that we have done and that we have available to us. Now, because we didn't have a wide panel that we could do, we have limitation on the number of IHCs that we can do. We decided to go ahead with our first differential, which is a trophoblastic neoplasm. So what we did there was we did a GATA3. GATA3 is a very good marker of uh, trophoblastic differentiation. And if your GATA3 is positive, we know that most likely it is a trophoblastic tumor. Then you go ahead with other combinations of markers, including P6 to 3 and human placental lactogen, beta, HCG, and KI6 to 7, to try to distinguish between the type of uh, intermediate trophoblast cells. And depending on what markers are positive, you will know what tumor it is. So I'll just take you through our IHC uh, results. So first we did a keratin because of course we had to rule out a carcinoma, although keratin I agree would have been positive in most of the other epithelial sarcomas as well. But here a pan-keratin was diffusely positive and uh, GATA3 was also positive, nice diffuse nuclear positivity for GATA3. So GATA3 positivity kind of helped exclude a lot of other differentials, including squamous cell carcinoma, cervix, leiomyosarcomas, ecomas, all of that. So with <coughs> GATA3 positivity, we went ahead with the next marker to find out the kind of trophoblastic cell that it is. So we did a P63, which was diffuse weak positive, and a KI67, which I'll tell you why, which was around 60%. So coming back to our trophogram, because our P63 was positive, ideally we should have done a human placental lactogen, but we don't have that. P63 being positive, it means that it, it this tumor is derived from chorionic type intermediate trophoblast. And there are only two things that come from chorionic type intermediate trophoblast. That is a placental site nodule and an epithelial trophoblastic tumor. Placental site nodule, this tumor is too big for that. So that's excluded. Then we're left with epithelial trophoblastic tumor. 
but there is also choriocarcinoma here which can show variable positivity for all these markers because choriocarcinomas are derived from a combination of cytotrophoblast and cytotrophoblast intermediate trophoblast all of those cells so all of those markers can be positive so we still haven't ruled out a choriocarcinoma so what do you do next that is where ki67 can help so we did a ki67 the WHO quotes a KI67 of more than 90% in choriocarcinoma. Our KI67 was about 50 to 60. So again, more in favor of epithelial trophoblastic tumor. Another marker which can help is SAL4. Because um, SAL4 is positive in cytotrophoblasts. And choriocarcinoma is the only tumor out of all these tumors that have a, a significant cytotrophoblast component. So we did a SAL4 and of course a beta XCV. Salford was negative and beta HCG was positive and scattered those big multinucleated cells that we saw, beta HCG was positive in that. So this, this level of beta HCG positivity was not enough to call it a choriocarcinoma. And epithelial trophoblastic tumors and uh, placental cytotrophic, all of those can have scattered beta HCG positive cells uh, in it as well. So based on the immunohistochemical profile and the morphology, we gave it, we reported this case as IHC morphology best in keeping with an epithelial trophoblastic tumor. Um, we couldn't commit to it 100% because of lack of clinical history uh, and lack of other immunohistochemical markers which weren't available. But the most important thing is that we need to distinguish it from a choriocarcinoma, which is what we see commonly, not, not very common, but among the trophoblastic tumors because choriocarcinomas are chemosensitive. Um, and the patient gets chemotherapy, whereas ETTs are not chemosensitive and you have to go for a hysterectomy. And these tumors have variable behavior. They can metastasize, they can be aggressive. So you need to identify these tumors. One thing which was unique about this case was that the size of the tumor, this was quite big. It was around nine centimeters, but usually ETTs, the maximum that I could see in literature was about five centimeters. So I, I don't know, you know, maybe they can be big. And uh, yeah, this is the rarest uh, trophoblastic neoplasm, but I think uh, Dr. Nazi has done a great job of uh, describing it and arriving at a differential, so good job. Any um, questions uh, on this case? Otherwise, we can move on to the next. And thank you. Thank yeah. you, ma'am. Any questions, uh, Dr. Nazim or anyone? I'll just check any questions in the YouTube. Uh, yeah, no questions in the YouTube. Well, so we can, we will. Yeah, ma'am, uh, any, any, any spotters, anything you like? Yes, to yeah, we have one spotter now. This is the spotter 40 year old with multiple sinuses over the knee joint. It came as query tuberculosis and, uh, I hope it's clear. Yeah, yeah it's clear. Yeah, great. Next. And this is another image. I think we'll uh, discuss the answer at the end of presentation too. Or yeah. Now we'll... yeah, yeah, we will discuss it. Yeah. And, um, any anyone, anyone any takers who, for this? Yeah, any... Immediately because it's a spotter. You can just... If you spot it, you say it, otherwise you yeah. can find Any of the panelists that are here. We'll count to five and we'll move to the next one. Okay. okay, I think uh, if if you if any of you figured it out, just put it in the chat box. We'll move on to the next presenter. You can raise your hands also if you want to say anything. Yeah, there is a one answer from the uh, in the YouTube. Uh, the answer is zygomycotic infection, most probably a basidobolomycosis from Dr. Anita Javalgi. Um, I think. Um... We have another chance that's not the right answer. Yeah, uh, the another uh, answer, uh, another couple of answers were fungal infection. Yeah. That's right, but which fungus? Yeah, no, more, no more answers, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll move on to the next presentation and uh, we can still, this will still be open at the end of the second presentation. If yeah. We'll keep looking at the chat for answers. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, yeah, there was one question from the uh, Dr. Suma. Uh, what was the BCG level? Uh, sorry, uh, beta HCG level. Sorry. 
So that we didn't have access to the beta HCG levels. We tried asking for the history, but uh, we couldn't get any history of the beta HCG levels. So that's why we couldn't give a confident uh, diagnosis. We, we had to rely completely on morphology and immunohistochemistry. Oh. And uh, Doctor, yeah. I think we also have an answer for our spotter from Dr. Chetana. That is uh, chromoblastomycosis. So that's the answer for spotter one. So moving on to presenter two. Yeah. Dr. Gayatri, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can start your uh, presentation. Yeah, it's visible. So is it visible? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Go ahead, madam. Good afternoon, everyone. So myself, Dr. Gayatri, representing AJ Institute of Medical Science and Research Center. The case given to me is case number two, with a history given as a 66-year-old female presenting with a mass in iliocolic region and had done a right hemicolectomy. So we had received the slide images. On evaluating the slide images, this was the first picture in which the scanner view itself, we can identify the type of the organ. Most commonly, it is mentioned in the history itself as the mass in iliocolic region in the right side. So in evaluating the site itself and evaluating with the sections given, we preferably refer to uh, the appendix and uh, the section uh, to, to longitudinal and one transfer section of the appendix will be given to us. And on further evaluating with the slides, you can see the lumen of the appendix. Further evaluating, you can see the infiltrating, diffuse infiltrating tumor cells in the appendix. And the diffuse infiltrating tumor cells are arranged in sheets, corpse and nest, mostly. And also in further evaluation with the high power view, we found out that predominantly the tumor cells are composed of signatrin cell morphology with abundant of uh, intracytoplasmic mucin forming a large vacuoles and which are compressing the nuclei to the periphery. Also, we noted large pools of extracellular mucin. Often in some other sections, we found out that there are tumor cells which are looking monomorphic, round, and which are having uniform cells with the round nuclei and the granular chromatin significantly referring to a salt and pepper chromatin with the eosinophilic cytoplasm. And these tumor cells, these dense tumor cells are infiltrating into the muscularis and which is extending to the adjacent periadipose tissue. And also noted lymphovascular invasion in perifocal points. The adjacent stroma, in this picture, we had the putty X view of the both the cells, tumor cells of the morphology with the uh, having a peripherally pushed nuclei, which is resembling that of the signal cell, and also with that of the uh, uniform round cells with the round nuclei and the granular chromatin and the sultan pepper chromatin. So, in evaluating, we found and uh, ended up in a differential diagnosis of ethanesial goblet cell adenocarcinoma, signal brain cell adenocarcinoma, and man. So, on further discussion with the differential diagnosis of the three, on discussion with appendiceal goblet cell adenocarcinoma, it is an amphicrine tumor which is composed of the goblet-like mucin cells, which is a variable number of endocrine cells and the panoplyte cells. It is also known as goblet cell carcinoma and the localization of the distal appendix. More often, uh, if we are looking on to the epidemiology, epidemiology, the most commonly age affected is 30 to 85 years with a mean age of 50 to 60 years. And the case which was given to us was 66 years. And the old terminology which is not recommended now for this is the goblet cell carcinoid, trip cell carcinoma, microglandular carcinoma, and the adenocarcinoid. There are certain essential criteria which has to be discussed for the appendiceal goblet cell adenocarcinoma. There are two types. We are classifying it into a low-grade appendiceal goblet cell adenocarcinoma and a high-grade appendiceal goblet cell adenocarcinoma. So the criteria is much important. The low-grade appendiceal adenocarcinoma shows the diffuse infiltrating of tumor cells arranged in tubules, which is composed of goblet-like mucinous cells. 
with a variable number of endocrine cells and thanatolite cells with a granular eosinophilic cytoplasm and abundant extracellular mucin was also noted. Whereas in discussing about the high grade, in discussing about the high grade pattern, the pattern itself is changing, whereas diffusely it is in anastomosing tubules with a cribriform architecture can be seen, in solid sheets can be seen, and numerically in large irregular clusters are also seen. The large aggregates of this goblet-like or signatron cells can be appreciated with lymphovascular and perineural invasion. So, in comparing with the two differential diagnoses, what we gave, how the signatron adenocarcinoma differs from the goblet cell adenocarcinoma. So, that question comes to your mind. Now, the answer for this is the goblet cell adenocarcinoma will be having a neuroendocrine component, which we already have in the low grade pattern that will be having a neuroendocrine component, whereas in case of your signatory cell adenocarcinoma, it is absent. So the answer is absence of recognizable low grade goblet cell adenocarcinoma component. And in evaluating with a third differential diagnosis of manic mixed adenoneuroendocrine carcinoma, previously used to refer as goblet cell adenocarcinoma, which is no longer considered as a type of implantial, but rather as an adenocarcinoma subtype. It contained both the components, including the epithelial or non neuroendocrine and the neuroendocrine component, and both components should be histologically and immunohistochemically proven. And another thing much important in case of manic is the neuroendocrine component, each constituting should be at least a 30 percentage of the tumor. And also in case in as per the WHO, both the histologically and the immunohistochemically, it should be proven. Along with that, it has a WHO criteria based on mitotic rate and chi 67 index, which we are grading in into well differentiated neuroendocrine G1, G2, G3, and poorly differentiated carcinomas. Further investigation of IHC to, in order to prove the neuroendocrine component, we have to proceed with the synaptopycin, chromogranin, in AC56 and 567. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gayatri. That was a very, very detailed explanation. And I think you have done more than half of my job in this. Uh, so we had got yeah, 66 year female uh, hemicolectomy specimen, right hemicolectomy for the ileocecal mass. Grossly, um, the right hemicolectomy specimen showed uh, ulcero polypoidal. It was a mucoidal growth involving the appendix, the cecum, and the ascending colon. Just a minute. So you can see uh, this is the appendix and it's uh, the mucosa is extensively ulcerated and the tumor is involving the whole circumference of the appendicial wall. In this section, you can see uh, this is actually the colon and uh, the mucosa as such, uh, it's not showing any dysplastic changes. The tumor seems to be arising from the base of the crypts and it is seen infiltrating uh, through the muscularis and into the pericolic fat and also there were multiple uh, peritoneal deposits as well. The differentials we received were uh, almost similar to what uh, Dr. Gayatri said, uh, manic that is mixed adeno neuroendocrine tumor, signet ring uh, adenocarcinoma, goblet cell adenocarcinoma, uh, which has been differentiated by Dr. Gayatri. But again, I'll just uh, mention it uh, in mixed um, adeno neuroendocrine carcinoma, that will be both the components, but both the components should be more than 30% of the tumor, the new, uh, the adeno component and the neuroendocrine component. Whereas in signet ring adenocarcinoma, the signet ring cells will be present, there's no neuroendocrine component, and this constitutes more than 50% of the tumor. Coming to goblet cell adenocarcinoma, which is the diagnosis, it's uh, the latest terminology which has been added in the WHO fifth edition. Um, and this tumor, which was earlier in the neuroendocrine neoplasm, now it has been uh, put into the adenocarcinoma group. Why is this? This is because it behaves more towards an adenocarcinoma. It's very aggressive tumor and uh, the survival, the prognosis also is bad. 
the treatment is similar to adenocarcinoma involving uh, the surgery that is hemicolectomy followed by chemotherapy these are my references thank you uh, now the spotter i think anyone can answer this uh, this is a 52 year female uh, who underwent uh, hysterectomy for fibroid uterus and this is the tumor which is seen in the myometrium next slide yeah can you see it yeah yeah it's visible okay okay any differentials Viewers, uh, kindly post your answers on YouTube uh, chat box. Somebody has said clear cell carcinoma. Open Asia has said clear cell carcinoma. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jeanette, uh, hemangio endothelioma. Yeah, I think someone has uh, identified it. Mukta Deshmukh. Yeah, Dr. Mukta has identified it correctly. It is an adenomatoid tumor uh, in the myometry. Also, any questions regarding uh, goblet cell adenocarcinoma? Uh, okay, we can move on to the next. Yeah, there, uh, yeah. Next presenter, Dr. Pooj. Uh, the third presenter can share their screen and start. Yeah. Good afternoon. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Pooja, first year PG from Bergam Institute of Medical Sciences. I'll be presenting case number three. The history given was 50 year old uh, female cuffed with expectoration since a month. CT showed the lesion in the right upper lobe. Coming to microscopy, the scanner view, we can uh, see a uh, lung parent uh, chyma and a uh, well circumscribed lesion predominantly having uh, hemorrhagic areas and the sclerotic areas. Here we can see a well circumscribed uh, partly encapsulated lesion uh, with underlying uh, tumor. Uh, we can uh, see uh, various, various uh, patterns like uh, papillary patterns. This uh, picture is showing a papillary pattern with uh, dual population of cells and hemorrhage. Uh, we, uh, the papillaries are uh, lined uh, by uh, cuboidal cells uh, which have uh, round nuclei with bland nuclear features and moderate amount of eosinophilic cytoplasm and the stromal cells uh, which are round uh, with uh, 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 gland the nuclear features and the fine chromatin with the moderate amount of cytoplasm. This is the solid uh, pattern of uh, tumor cells arranged in solid pattern. And uh, we can also see vascular spaces lined by cuboidal uh, cells. And few Jane cells are also uh, seen. Uh, at few foci, we can see the few atypical cells with the hyperchromasia, but there is uh, no abnormal mitotic figures or invasion. Uh, here again, we can see uh, numerous uh, vascular spaces and sclerotic areas. There is extensive sclerotic areas lined by cuboidal epithelial cells. Few eosinophilic concentrically laminated structures, which are known as lamellar bodies, were also seen. And there are secondary changes uh, like large areas of hemorrhage, hemosiderin uh, laden macrophages, and also cholesterol cleft from uh, crystals. In the adjacent lung parenchyma, we could see the congested blood vessels, areas of hemorrhage, and aggregates of uh, hemosiderin laden macrophages. And there are also features of uh, hemosidrosis in the background. So the key points it is a 50 year old female patient. A microscope is showing well circumscribed partly capsulated lesion in the lung with two population of benign looking cells uh, having a papillary solid sclerotic and angiomatoid patterns and with the presence of inflammation in the background like uh, plasma cells, hemosiderin laden macrophages, cholesterol clefts and lamellar bodies 
the probable diagnosis uh, would be sclerosing pneumocytoma. I would like to have two differential diagnosis of a papillary adenoma because of presence of a few papillaries and uh, epithelioid hemangioendothelium because of presence of papillaries, neurotic areas and vascular areas. For further workup, I had seen uh, in the sclerosing hemocytoma, the surface cells will be positive for uh, TTF1, EMA, and cytokeratin, surfactant markers, dementin, and napsinin. And the stromal cells will be positive for the TTF1, EMA, dementin, estrogen, and progesterone. Uh, while the surfactant uh, markers will be negative. Uh, coming to uh, the differential diagnosis, uh, epithelioid hemangioendothelium, it will be positive for endothelial markers like uh, CD31, CD34, and ERG. While the papillary adenoma will be uh, positive for T uh, TTF1 and EMA, on, uh, these uh, will be positive only in epithelial cells and not the stromal cells. Thank you. A uh, great job, <clears throat> Dr. Pooja. Even even our approach was uh, similar to this. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So uh, we received a upper lobectomy specimen with a clinical diagnosis of pseudo aneurysm from an elderly female who presented with uh, expectorant cough for about a month. So the clinical diagnosis, what they gave us was aneurysm. Uh, so looking at the gross picture, the upper lobe had a large nodule, which was unencapsulated and almost, you know, bigger, uh, measuring about 5.5 into 5 by 4.5 centimeters. Part section showed a well-circumscribed solid hemorrhagic areas. So with, in this, uh, considering this, gross picture. So we had a differential of pulmonary hematoma, hemangioma, carcinoid, adenocarcinoma, and metastasis. Moving on to the microscopy. So, as explained by Pooja, this is a well circumscribed tumor. And what, what uh, majority of this lesion was predominantly hemorrhagic, with you know, uh, and most of the areas being occupied by sclerosis. And uh, the cellular areas were distributed in solid as well as the sclerotic papillary pattern. So, the clinching, what, what was clinching about this diagnosis is the four patterns one is the hemorrhage, second is the sclerosis, third is the cellularity, and fourth is the papillary pattern. So you have uh, definitely done a very good job in explaining uh, these four things. So, and you have focused the perfect point wherein, you know, even I have taken a screenshot of the same thing, the same nodule. So here, if you look at this particular nodular area, you get to see the surface cells, which show the hobnaily, which are nothing but the cuboidal cells, the surfaces. And the stromal cells are the round cells. So, uh, and they are, Predominantly bland looking, there was no sign of any mitosis, no uh, pleomorphism, absolutely benign looking. And looking at the margins, the tumor margin, it was well encapsulated, I mean, uh, well circumscribed, and there was no evidence of invasion. So, the same images have been depicted here, the cellularity, the hemorrhagic areas, papillary pattern, and the two population of cells. So with this morphology, our top differentials were sclerosing pneumocytoma and epithelial hemangioendothelioma has, we were only thinking in terms of the benign uh, nature of the lesion. And the other differentials which we received apart from the top two were adenocarcinoma, metastasis, squamous cell carcinoma, plasma cell granuloma, and pancoast tumor. Uh, however, majority have given us the right diagnosis of sclerosing pneumocytoma. So, um, here uh, in, in our uh, case, uh, there was no evidence of squamous differentiation nor any atypical cells. So, we are, uh, or neither there was any invasion. So, we are, uh, we have ruled out the uh, malignant part. So, we are left out with sclerosing pneumocytoma and the epithelial hemangioendothelioma. 
epithelial hemangioendothelioma though it simulates sclerosing pneumocytoma however if you look at the other areas the surrounding areas there was no mitoid stroma or there was no blister cells what the tumor cells which tried to encapsulate the uh, vasculature so that was not identified so considering like you know morphology we were still uh, left with two uh, diagnosis we went ahead with the ihc so ihc um, four we chose four markers initially ttf1 ema napsin and cd34 so the surface and the stromal cells were positive for ttf and ema whereas the napsin a uh, the stromal cells was uh, did not take up any stain so it was, uh, the stromal cells were negative for napsin a and cd34 was negative so which helped us come to a diagnosis of sclerosing pneumocytoma so to summarize a uh, young female with a small nodule so which was a little un unlike our case where it was the presentation was in a elderly female and the with a uh, you know large nodule so this is something which occurs in a young female with small nodule uh, and grossly looking solid and hemorrhagic with microscopically having four patterns which i already ex uh, explained it and uh, the lesion is considered to be benign however uh, given the fact that it is recurrent and it can metastasize so the treatment of choice is lobectomy so further confirmation can be done with akt1 molecular studies and uh, i think uh, i think we are done with presentation so moving on to the spotter so 8 year old with nodular erosion in rectum so it, it is a easy one uh, dr vasvaraj are there any tech uh, uh, connectivity issues at our end or is it smooth no 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 it's smooth sir no no issues it's smooth okay fine yeah we have first answer from uh, uh, we got a response yeah from janet we got the zena bega message am i be yes yes we yes. got the right one zena yeah okay thank you yeah we can move to the next okay uh, so case number 4 dr jena starting sir Hello, everyone. Am, uh... Hello, everyone. Am, am I audible to everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This yes. is case number four 15 year old male with a retromolar swelling representing KBN Medical College. Uh, this was a slide. Uh, where uh, the squamous lining were there and there was a dip into the uh, deeper areas where there is a transformation of uh, squamous epithelium to a glandular epithelium is seen. And there are a lot of uh, uh, glands seen around the, just below the epidermis. And uh, squamous cell is also not looking very good. Here are the um, sections from the glandular area showing uh, hyperchromasia as well as uh, there is a slight uh, stratification is also there. And, uh, looking like infiltration of these glands and here are the cubital cells as well as uh, the um, the areas which is looking like papillary areas pseudopapillary or a papillary foldings like and here there are again a mild pleomorphism is visible and uh, there is a transformation from the squamous epithelium to adeno here there are again with a lot of mitotic activities as well as Pneumorphism, hyperchromasia is seen. In the, some other pictures showing uh, stratification, nuclear hyperchromasia. The other gates of the glands within the stroma having a pleomorphic appearance. And the squamous nest having a, within the stroma. What uh, was it was thought from our department was adenosquamous cell carcinoma, but why in 15 year old? Then uh, this is the malignant neoplasm arising from the uh, 
for the mucosal epithelium, mixed tumor composed of neoplastic uh, squamous cells to the areas of glandular differentiation, dif uh, dysplastic stratified squamous epithelium uh, that extends the basement membrane and into the underlying fibrous connected tissue without attachment to the surface. The malignant epithelial cells shows uh, isnophilic cytoplasm, hyperchromatic nuclei, primorphism, mitotic activity, and intracellular bridging is also available uh, is seen. The squamous cell and glandular pattern, both components are usually discrete, but mixtures can be formed. Glands produce interluminal and intracellular mucin. Uh, so there's nothing much to discuss here. To in order to differentiate uh, the squ uh, squamous component, uh, uh, five and six keratin can be taken, CK5 and six, and TTF1 for adenocarcinoma component. So as per AFIP, the classification is from this minor salivary glands and uh, uh, or otherwise WHO, it is a variant of, rare variant of squamous cell carcinoma. I uh, now hand it over to the organizers for the further discussion. I have only this much from the department. Thank you, Dr. Zinat. Uh, let me give a brief uh, description of the case. A 15-year-old male with a growth over the gingival region, the existential biopsy specimen was sent. Grossly, it was a polypoidal mucosal mass showing some whitish gray areas on cut section, measuring around 1 into 1 into 0.8 centimeters, along with few areas of hemorrhage. Coming to the microscopic findings, we see a stratified squamous epithelial line tissue which is showing features of hyperplasia and we see that dipping into the stroma, this area shows gastric type glands and This area shows some uh, columnar lined epithelial cells along with few goblet cells. So this is intestinal type epithelium. So there is no atypia or dysplasia and we do not find any HNR or tubular structures in this. All these are glandular co uh, columnar lined epithelium. So which is basically ectopic uh, gastrointestinal tissue which is seen in the oral cavity. For so this case, we received some differentials. Majority of the people told it was a sialadenoma papilliferum. Few others, they have given a choreostoma in the oral cavity. And some gave a differentials of adenosquamous and intestinal type adenocarcinoma, salivary duct carcinoma. Uh, all the malignancies have been ruled out because there is no atypia or any mitotic figures are noted. And uh, the salivary gland components like the SNR or the ductal structures are not identified. So all of them are ruled out. So to summarize, this is a case of heterotopia of the gastrointestinal epithelium into the oral cavity. This is a rare developmental anomaly which usually occurs in the male infants and children. It arises from the pluripotent primitive stem cells, usually presenting as a polypoidal mass 
and excision is the treatment of choice. Can we go ahead with the spotter? Yes, madam, you can go ahead. So, a 30 year old male presenting with a swelling on the forearm. Any takers for this? I'll be sure that but there's one more image. Yeah. We'll just show you the previous image again in case you missed it. So this is one. This is the next. Any takers? Please let us know in the chat box. Angiolipoma. Okay. Yeah. Go on to the next. Okay, answer is uh, angiolipoma. We'll move on to the next case. Thank you, Dr. Sopnika. This is is the last of the histopath. Yes. The last of the histopath cases. Uh, can we have case number five? Uh, yes, Dr. Sri. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Thank Sri, yeah. Yeah. Sir, am I uh, visible, sir? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, you are visible. Okay. Um, I'm Dr. Sriya Sadish, second year postgraduate student from Ambedkar Medical College, Hosp College and Hospital, Bangalore. We were uh, allotted case number five for the uh, discussion. The, uh, this is a case of a 37-year-old male with gradually progressive blindness in the left eye since childhood, now associated with pain and underwent enucleation. So here we can see the whole, whole mount view of the eye. The layers of the eye is seen here from outside to inside the sclera, choroid, and uh, retina. A lesion is seen uh, as noted extending. Uh, arising from the retina and extending into the vitreous. Posteriorly, we can see the optic nerve and the uh, adjacent to it is the extraocular uh, muscles. Here, this is a low power view showing the lesion within the vitreous. And this is a high power view of the lesion showing uh, dilated thin walled in interconnected vascular spaces which are lined by a continuous flattened endothelial lining. And the vascular lumen is filled with RBC and the vascular spaces are separated by mild to moderate amount of fibrous tissue stroma. And uh, also noted was pigmented tissue in between the lesion. On uh, other other findings we had noted are metaplastic ossification. Uh, here we can see the low power view in which uh, near to the lesion we can see the metaplastic ossification. And this is a high power view uh, showing uh, of the same area. And we had uh, in another section, it was also noted, uh, this is a ciliary, ciliary body in the iris. And the angle between the iris and the uh, cornea was uh, seen to be reduced by, uh, because of the formation of sinecae. So we had uh, thought of um, that um, the reason for the pain in the patient can be because of the angle closure glaucoma. And uh, in another section, it is also noted, uh, we can see the uh, retinal detachment, which we thought could be the reason for the uh, slowly progressive blindness in the uh, patient. So based on the above findings, we came to the diagnosis of cavernous hemangioma of retina with metaplastic ossification. And the differential we had thought of was retinal hemangioblastoma. Uh, in retinal hemangioblastoma, we can see capillary-sized vascular channels surrounded by stromal cells, which are characteristically have the prominent evacuated cytoplasm, which is not senior. And also tumor-led uh, cells are also not senior. So we had ruled uh, this out. And next uh, differential we had thought of was Cotts disease, because uh, we can see telangiectatic uh, retinal vessels, but uh, subretinal fluid with cholesterol clefts and 
lipid laden macrophages was not seen in the current uh, case and thus we had ruled out coats disease and the further investigations uh, uh, which could be done are iac markers like cgit cd31 sma uh, and sma and desmin is positive in spindle cells of the vascular wall thank you Thank you, Dr. Shreya. That was a very elaborate presentation. I think uh, you almost covered all the points here. Thank you, ma'am. Speak and share. You can go to the next one. All right. Uh, myself, Dr. Srijana Rao. Uh, so we have received a enucleated specimen of a 37 year old male patient with a clinical history of gradually progressive blindness in the left eye uh, started ever since his childhood now recently with recent onset pain clinical diagnosis given to us was a choroidal melanoma this was the enucleated specimen that we received without the optic nerve stock on cut section there was a blackish pigmented uh, growth uh, in the uh, appeared to arise from the choroid, measuring about 1.7 to 1 into 1 centimeter, and the growth was confined to the posterior chamber. Anterior chamber was free of uh, any growth, and uh, and as you can see, as you can see here, the growth was uh, unifocal. It it was confined to only one part of the posterior chamber. Based on this, the gross differentials that we considered were uh, the neoplasm that could arise from the choroid. Um, Due to its pigmented nature, we considered choroidal nevus or melanoma, choroidal hemangioma, and metastasis are, as our gross differentials. Microscopically, uh, uh, we all embedded the uh, eyeball, and uh, you can see the whole mount of eyeball here with the intact sclera. And uh, like you, like uh, Dr. Shri has rightly explained, there is significant amount of uh, retinal detachment and uh, some intravitreous hemorrhage. And uh, this is the sclera, and we can see a lobulated. Uh, it's a well circumscribed uh, neoplasm arising from the choroid, which contains cavernously dilated uh, uh, spaces containing uh, blood which is lined by flattened endothelial cells and uh, the stroma contains some pigmented cells and uh, there are uh, some osteoid uh, metaplasia as well, the areas of osteoid metaplasia as well. And there is, uh, we did not find any ATP or anything in the uh, multiple sections that were studied. So the differentials we received for this case, um, most of them have unanimously given the differential diagnosis of cavernous hemangioma. Some of them have called with retinal detachment and uh, some of them uh, have called it as vascular hematoma. Uh, we received one differential of retinal angiomatous proliferation then uh, and uh, one differential of hemangioblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma each. Uh, so based on the morphology, uh, we would like to go ahead with the di diagnosis of cavernous hemangioma. Retinal angiomatous proliferation, uh, uh, it is a variant of age-related uh, macular degeneration which occurs in elderly individuals and also it uh, it would not uh, present as a neoplasm, it will not present as a growth, it would, uh, uh, it is just a chorioretinal uh, anastomosis and uh, retinal detachment, yes, there is retinal detachment in this, uh, in our case also which could be a part of the hemangioma, uh, long-standing uh, duration of, uh, as a progression of disease. Hemangioblastoma, it's uh, mainly a tumor that would arise in the cerebellum, in the brain and spinal cord. Yes, retinal hemangioblastoma cases are recorded, but uh, in our case, the morphology doesn't favor because there is no not much of stromal cells that we see, and in hemangioblastoma, there would be small-sized capillary-sized blood vessels admixed with this neoplastic stromal cells, which is not in our case, which is, in our case, it is mostly the cavernous type of hemangioma. Uh, rhabdoid uh, morphology, uh, the cells with rhabdoid morphology or atypical cells are not seen, sarcomatoid cells are not seen, so rhabdomyosarcoma is not considered as our differential. Uh, so to, to summarize this case, we called it circumscribed choroidal hemangioma, which is an uncommon benign vascular tumor arising from the choroid. 
it can be circumscribed or diffuse. The diffuse type, uh, it is having syndromic association with Sturge Weber syndrome. So, usually detected while during the uh, workup of Sturge Weber syndrome. Uh, circumscribed type is often sporadic and usually detected around the age group of 20 to 40 years with slight male preponderance. It is almost always unilateral and uh, unifocal. Uh, so it is mostly asymptomatic and the symptoms like uh, gradually progressive blindness or the painful blind eye, all that occurs due to the secondary retinal detachment or uh, like uh, Dr. Shriya rightly pointed out, there could be uh, added neovascular glau glaucoma that would lead to all these clinical findings. On fundoscopy, it appears as an orange reddish mass, which could mimic uh, melanoma. That is what happened in our case. Uh, so, amelanotic melanoma is a common mimicker for choroidal hemangioma. So, choroidal hemangioma is a uh, benign case. So, management is mostly by photo uh, photodynamic therapy, laser photocoagulation, radiotherapy, or intravitreal anti VGF injection. Enucleation is not the management of therapy unless it is a painful blind eye or uh, untreatable uh, neovascular glaucoma has developed. But in our case, uh, enucleation was done because it was suspected as choroidal uh, melanoma. Uh, so, uh, that is the clinical awareness ne uh, that need to be known that this uh, 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 un un it I mean, avoidable enucleation uh, is possible. So, these are my references. Any questions? So, we'll go ahead with the spotter. It's a 29 year old male with left thigh nodule. Uh, please comment on the pattern as well as the special stain here and then the diagnosis. You can either raise your hand or you can just type your answers in the chat box. Oh, put it on slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, you can answer separately. If you know the special stain, you can just put that in, even if you're not sure about the diagnosis. Okay, first stain hemocytrin, Dr. Zena Pagan. Dr. Pooja says melanoma. So, what it gives in the story, but you might first take the pigment to Okay, okay, okay. Dr. Chetana has called it as the pigmented DFSP. Uh, that's the right answer. This is uh, hemosidrotic uh, fibrohistiocytoma that Pearlstein has taken uh, strongly positive for all the hemosidrotic cells. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shijana. So now we move on to the hematology cases. We'll have the first presenter for case or other. Uh, we'll have the presenter for case number six. Please. If you can just uh, put it on slideshow. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, is it visible? Yeah, make it I full screen. See your screen, but not yet uh, slideshow. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Mohammed Imtiaz Mukaram, second year resident from Alamin Medical College. Uh, the case was allotted to me was case number six. History says 45 year old male with anemia under evaluation. This is the peripheral smear study with Lishma stain showing predominantly macrocytes with normocytic and microcytic RBCs. Ovulocytes with occasional tear drop cells, target cell, and cystocytes are also seen. There are nucleated RBCs around 20 to 25. Uh, 20 to 25 uh, per high power field. There is no hemoparasite seen. Uh, you can also see the WBC is present there. The total counts of the WBC is reduced. Uh, the DC neutrophil shows 55%. Neutrophilic shift to left is seen. Uh, many of the neutrophils show biologue nuclei. Lymphocytes are less in count, 3%. Eosinophil on the upper side can see around uh, 10 to 12% is seen. There are many atypical cells seen in this slide. Uh, around uh, range from 30 to 35 percent. Platelets are singly distributed and appears normal in the number and morphology. Uh, this is the spe special stain, tauledin blue or methylene blue. The morphology of this atypical cells are seen. 
Uh, they are large cells with large nucle nuclei with two to three prominent nucleoli, and cytoplasm is moderately bluish. Can be a basophilic basophil. Uh, so summary of the case is RBC is predominantly macrocytic with microcytic and normocytic RBCs. Ovulocytes with occasional teardrops at target cells and cystocytes are seen. Nucleated RBCs 25 to 30 per high power pill. No hemoparasite seen. Uh, WBC is total count reduced. DC neutrophils 55%, lymphocytes 3%, eosinophil 8 to 10%. Uh, atypical large cells can be a base of 30 to 35%. Platelet singly distributed and normal in number. Uh, differential diagnosis can be retroblastic reaction, can be myelofibrosis or myeloproliferative disorder. Uh, acute basophilic leukemia, chronic eosinophilic leukemia, severe deficiencies of vitamin B12, folate, and iron deficiency anemia. Uh, second history is a 37 year old female uh, anemia under evaluation. This is a peripheral smear study. It was predominantly microcytic hypochromic RBCs with uh, uh, anisopyculocytosis. Many polychromatic cells are seen with cystocytes and pencil cells. WBCs are normal in number, morphology, and distribution. Uh, platelets are normal in number. Uh, this is a special stain, methylene blue or brilliant crystal blue, burden uh, for retic count. This is a, there are multiple reticular sites seen, the total around 7 to 8 percent. Uh, so, summary is uh, predominantly microcytic hypochromic RBCs with N isopyculocytosis, many polychromatophilic cells with few teardrop cells, spherocytes, and pencil cells seen, no nucleated RBCs, no hemoparasites. Uh, WBC is normal in number, morphology, and distribution. Platelet is normal in number and morphology. Differential diagnosis can be hemolytic anemia, severe nutritional deficiencies, and myelofibrosis. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Intias, for this attempt. Uh, before proceeding with my presentation, I would just, I would like to bring this to everybody's notice that for this particular case, we had divided, we had given a lot of sub-questions. So it was divided into A and B, and both had eight sub-questions. Uh, the purpose of the sub-questions was to highlight the importance of each of the sub-questions which we had given which in fact helps us in uh, coming to a diagnosis or if not coming to an accurate diagnosis, it at least gives us a direction. Uh, I will go through each of those sub questions separately for these uh, cases and uh, let us see if we can understand at each uh, step, if we can get some information at each step. So first case 6A, uh, the history given, so we didn't dwell much into the history because we wanted to focus on the morphology, CBC data, and the RBC histogram, as sometimes uh, history may not be available to us and further investigations may not be available to us, but what is available to us at all points of time is the CBC data, our histogram, and morphology. So the highlight was on these points. So firstly, CBC data. This was the CBC data given, which shows anemia, and uh, normocytic anisochromia and increased RDW. PS findings, as uh, Dr. Imtiaz mentioned, there was uh, severe anisopoikilocytosis, as everybody can appreciate on this smear, uh, predominantly target cells. There were a few spirocytes and, uh, and fragmented RBCs. And uh, the highlight of this smear is the presence of NRBCs. There were plenty of NRBCs. And platelet counts appear to be uh, platelets appear to be increased even on the morphology. And this uh, is uh, AI image. Uh, this uh, highlights the NRBCs present. The third uh, sub question was to interpret the RBC histogram. Uh, we would actually have preferred if all these questions were taken separately and addressed. It's okay, I will uh, explain what we were looking for in this particular uh, set of questions. So RBC histogram on the right side given is a normal histogram. On the left side is of our case. So the responses that we received were dimorphic picture, 
increased rdw and fragmented rbc's dimorphic picture usually as you can uh, see the rbc histogram doesn't start from the baseline so dimorphic picture the rbc histogram usually starts from the baseline and then a bimodal peak is noted but in this particular case the presence of fragmented rbc's is seen and the width of the rbc histogram the increased width indicates anisocytosis uh, which was pointed out by uh, quite a few people. So increased RDW, anisocytosis and fragmented RBCs are noted. Platelet histogram on the right side, it is normal. And in our case, it almost like, looks normal, but we received various responses, thrombocytosis. It is difficult to comment on thrombocytosis based on platelet histogram. And uh, fragmented RBCs have been counted as platelets and uh, some people had said that it looks like spurious thrombocytosis. But the platelet histogram looks like very normal. So we would go with a normal interpretation of the platelet histogram. Clumps, it wouldn't look like this if the clumps are there or even if giant platelets are present. Uh, the stain that we had mentioned was a supravital stain. So it was uh, given, in, uh, I mean, it was mentioned that the, uh, it was right jinsa and supravital stained images were shared. Supravital stain shows increase in reti count. Uh, there is nothing else of significance. A lot of people had pointed out on uh, saying that they could see Heinz bodies, but we couldn't appreciate Heinz bodies. It is all mature reticulocytes that were noted. Final impression of peripheral smear is that it is a hemolytic anemia, a possibly hemoglobinopathy. Uh, we also noted neutrophilic leukocytosis and thrombocytosis, and I will get back to these points in a while. The responses received were hemolytic anemia, G6PD deficiency. A lot of people favored G6PD deficiency, and uh, but uh, morphology in G6PD deficiency uh, it doesn't fit G6PD uh, deficiency. The morphology because we don't see increased target cells in G6PD, and we don't see spirocytes. What is predominantly seen in uh, RBC enzyme defect is the bite cells and blister cells, which were not seen in this case. So it is hemolytic anemia, yes, but based on morphology and the other findings, we don't, uh, we didn't consider G6PD uh, deficiency. Uh, hemolytic anemia to rule out thalassemia, yes. Possibility of thal trait can be considered. Thal trait will not have such severe anisocytosis, so this was not thal trait. A uh, picture with one person thought of atypical lymphocytes. I am not entirely sure why uh, WBCs were, uh, I mean, why atypical lymphocytes uh, were thought of. Uh, there were no atypical lymphocytes in the images that we have provided. They were predominantly uh, neutrophils and NRBCs. Clinical findings uh, that you would like to request for. So the answers that we were looking for was icterus organomegaly, blood transfusion and family history. In this particular case, there was history of icterus organomegaly and uh, history of blood transfusion, no significant family history. Uh, others had uh, suggested drug intake, lead poisoning, respiratory distress, frontal bossing, dark colored urine, all very valid. But clinically what gives, uh, what is of more importance is icterus uh, organomegaly and transfusion and frontal bossing it was a 45 year old male so we weren't expecting thalassemia major in this particular case and drug intake was asked for and there was no significant history so the next three tests that we would like to do in this particular case the answers that we were looking for was hemoglobin electrophoresis or hplc lft and molecular studies the responses that we received were uh, various types of responses all valid but predominantly based on morphology so dct ict will show uh, spirocytes and in this uh, what we were looking at were mainly target cells uh, hb electrophoresis hplc yes nestrop is not uh, done i mean uh, electrophoresis and hplc have replaced the nestrop test so that is what is done routinely g6pd levels were normal genetic testing yes lft x-ray skull and axial bones don't really, uh, they are just supportive evidence, but they are not necessary to arrive at a diagnosis. This was the WBC scatter plot uh, showing increased NRBCs. The pink population are the increased NRBCs. And if you, uh, if you had observed the smear carefully, the arrow mark uh, points at Howell Jolly bodies. And this was the electrophoresis finding, uh, AF 
E and A2 levels are present. Presence of E along with elevated F favors HBE beta thalassemia. So this was a double heterozygous E beta thalassemia status post splenectomy. And that is why we were seeing increase in uh, neutrophil count, thrombocytosis and Howell's jolly bodies. Uh, 6B, uh, again, history given was anemia and under the same subheadings, I will quickly run through this case. Uh, CBC data showed MHA with increased RDWCV with 24%. PS findings were striking and it showed like severe anisopoikilocytosis with plenty of fragmented cells, teardrop cells, elliptocytes, like all sorts of poikilocytes are noted in this particular case. So, uh, and uh, so that that is what we would like to highlight that morphology in this particular case shows severe anisopoikilocytosis. RBC histogram again doesn't start from the baseline. It indicates fragmented RBCs. Again, there were responses received as dimorphic picture, but this is fragmented RBCs, like a lot of severe fragmented RBCs uh, increase in those cells as uh, seen in the peripheral smear Im image also. Platelet histogram is uh, definitely not normal as compared with the normal platelet histogram provided on the right side. So skewed to right, as someone had rightly pointed out, spurious thrombocytosis agreed with this one. Abnormal distribution or clumping. Clumping would not look like this. Clumping or giant cells, giant platelets will not look like this. Fragmented RBCs interpreted as platelets, that is right. So supravital stain, uh, if you notice, uh, shows these HBH inclusion bodies. Uh, these inclusion bodies are because of precipitation of beta chains and these resemble a golf ball and hence are called as golf ball inclusions which were striking in the images that we had provided. So final impression uh, is hemolytic anemia, possibly hemoglobinopathy. Now the thrombocytosis like we already discussed is uh, not, the impedance has not calculated the true count of platelets and has given us spurious thrombocytosis. So uh, correlation with the smear is important in this case. The responses that we received was MHA with thrombocytosis uh, when hemolytic anemia, that's true. Alpha thalassemia with G6PD deficiency. I'm not sure again why G6PD deficiency was thought of in this case. Hemolytic anemia, possibility of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and G6PD. Maha will not show all, so all this kind of severe anisopoikilocytosis. All we see predominantly is schistocytes. And immune hemolytic anemia, again, we see with respect to immune hemolytic anemia, either spirocytes are noted on the smear or RBC agglutination, not this kind of anisopoikilocytosis. Thaltrate uh, will not look, uh, will not show again this kind of hemolytic blood picture. Icterus organomegaly, uh, history of blood transfusion, uh, same as the previous case. And next three tests would be electrophoresis, LFT, and molecular studies. Again, we received various responses for this. Ion studies all right, but bone marrow examination is not needed in this case. Uh, DCT, ICT, USG abdomen uh, for organomegaly agreed. Uh, LFT, molecular testing, yes. So this was uh, WBC uh, scatter plot. It looks quite neat. And compared to the previous case, one thing which is striking is the absence of NRBCs. We don't see, even with this kind of severe hemolytic blood picture, we are not seeing NRBCs in this particular case. Electrophoresis showed a band in zone 15, which is suggestive of HBH. So this was a HBH disease. So what we would like to highlight with these two cases is clinical presentation is important. Anemia, icterus, organomegaly in this particular case, CBC data showing MHA, a hemolytic anemia with microcytic hypochromic indices. Uh, we would like everybody to think of uh, thalassemias first uh, compared to the other hemolytic anemias. Uh, and the RBC and platelet histograms provide major clues in arriving at a diagnosis. Uh, red cell morphology with severe anisopoikilocytosis. So with respect to hemolytic anemias, G6PD enzyme deficiency, we are looking at white cells, blister cells, which were not there in this case. Hereditary spirocytosis or elliptocytosis show uh, respective cells, spirocytes or elliptocytes on the smear. Again, with, we were not seeing those in this case. Immune hemolytic anemia against spirocytes or autoagglutination, which was not noted in this case. So severe anisopoikilocytosis usually favors a hemoglobinopathy. And it's most of you have uh, picked it right. It is a hemolytic anemia favoring hemoglobinopathy. 
and considering the age of presentation, it is an intermediate phenotype. Thank you. Any questions? One question in the black box. Hmm. Since an article in 1500, the correct frequency hmm. was not met. So, why leukocytosis? Uh, so the leukocytosis is because of postplanectomy. So postplanectomy, the average neutrophil count is higher than the normal. Uh, the neutrophilic leukocytosis is because of postplanectomy. So that was also a clue. Uh, any more any questions? questions? Um, Okay. Yeah. We'll go to we'll the, next. Go to the next case. Case number seven presenter. Okay. Dr. Viona. Yeah. Yes. Ah, okay, sure. You can start sharing your screen. I'll start. I've shared my screen, sir. It's not visible. Uh, it's coming online. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Please, yeah, yeah, please. Go. My case allotted is uh, case number seven. I'm Dr. Yona Diguna, second year postgraduate from the Department of Pathology, SNMC Bavari Court. My case number seven A is 70 year old male com complains of splenomegaly with increased leukocytosis. This is an an impression on refined biopsy was asked. Here is a picture of on scanner view. The scanner view shows that the scanner view shows no fat cells. Only that that indicates that this the refined biopsy is hypercellular. So coming to differential diagnosis, in in our case we. We found out we gave the differential diagnosis of chronic myeloproliferative neoplasm with differential diagnosis of chronic myeloproliferative leukemia and chronic granulocytic leukemia. From in our defined biopsy, we found out that sections from the bone marrow biopsy are highly cellular with increased in myeloid series of cells. The ratio was from myeloid to erythroid ratio was 3.5 is to 1. With erythroid series in normal maturation, with myeloid series showing predominantly mature neutrophils and increase in eosinophils, and in megakaryocytic megakaryopoiesis, uh, megakaryo um, there was increase in megakaryocytic hypoplasia. Here in this image, we found out that there is increased hypercellularity, and there was this is a low power view. And in following, sir, I think my PPT is stuck. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, I think it's coming and, back. Yes. And in the medium power view, we could see there were mega there, there was clustering of mega karyocytes and there was this karyopoiesis evident. And then there were also predominant eosinophils which were seen. So my PPT. Yes. Okay. Here is a picture depi depicting megakaryocytes and abnormal mitosis, indicating uh, react, uh, that bone marrow is hypercellular. And also there is a there is a cell showing M periposis. Here again we can see on under high power view there, there are clusters of megakaryocytes. And so finally, we would like to, the next the next test what we would like to recommend is BCR ABL1 fusion. As in 90% of the myeloproliferative neoplasms, it is positive. Now, case 7B. It was 60-year-old male with history of splenomegaly with leukocytosis and thrombocytosis. Here is a scanner view.
on low power view we could see megakaryocytes which are loose, loosely in clusters and under low power view we can also see they are large and there is hyperlobation seen with stag horn pattern here is is a hypernucleated hyperlobated uh, megakaryocyte with stag horn pattern stag horn nucleus Here also we can lose loose clusters of um, megakaryocytes and uh, and stagon pattern. So from our bone marrow biopsy, we found out it is normal cellular with myeloid erythroid ratio four is to one with normal granulocytic proliferation and erythroid series is normal in maturation with megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytic hyperplasia with hyperlobated nuclei. Our diagnosis for 7B cases essential thrombocytemia. We would like to do cytogenetics of JAK2 mutation, CALR, and MPL. Thank you. Viona. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Viona. That was a nice presentation, but there are a few things which we'll go through. Uh, so the history given was for case A, it is 70-year-old male presenting with splenomegaly and leukocytosis. So these were the responses that we received saying myeloproliferative neoplasm, which is six of them, and wow. then PMF three five two six. Sir, uh, can you yeah. uh, uh, present your PPT? It's not visible. Oh. Okay. 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 Share. Is it visible now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. It's visible. Sir, it's it's yes. visible. Yeah, okay. So this was the history which was given a 70 year old male uh, splenomegaly with leukocytosis and we had asked final impression on the terpene. So the responses we received were MPN6 and then uh, PMF prefibrotic stage, nine of them and few of them called it ET, PV and CMN and few showed its granulomatous and Hodgkin's. So we'll just uh, go through the approach what we wanted. So. With the scan of view, as rightly pointed by Dr. Viona, it is yes, there are no fat spaces, so definitely it is a hypercellular marrow. But when we zoom in, so you have we have a lot of the mega kerosites which are clustered, which are kind of very dense clustering, is what we would say. But what's also highlighted in these is the hyperchromasia in the mega kerosites and also. The bizarre shapes which you can see in most of the mega cells. And when you see the biopsy as a whole, yes, there is myeloid preponderance. Why it is not CML? It's because of the mega morphology. In a CML, the mega cells are always small, hypolobated kind of thing. But here we have slightly enlarged mega cells with which have very irregular nucleus and they have hyperchromatic nucleus. So there we are kindly deviating from, it is a MPN because, because we are looking at increased megakaryocytes and hypercellular marrow and also the myeloid preponderance. So with the megakaryocyte morphology, so the findings, if we can summarize, it's a hypercellular marrow, increased megakaryocytes. So it's just like how we can focus in a microscope from scanner to low power and then to higher power. And then you look at clustering. Yes, there is clusters of megakaryocytes, some of which have almost up to eight megakaryocytes. When you look at the size, there is mild to moderate anisocytosis. And when you come to the nuclear morphology, they have that ATP, bizarre hyperchromatic forms. And when you look at the rest of the elements myeloid is predominant so definitely erythroid is suppressed 
and in few foci there is streaming of hematopoietic cells. So since megakaryocyte morphology is about the bizarre hyperchromatic form, this is a myeloproliferative neoplasm and it is primary myelofibrosis. Since it is hypercellular and it is the patient is presenting with leukocytosis, it's likely prefibrotic. And then we ask what are the next tests which you would recommend? The response is received. There was one person who actually got everything right, saying reticulin stain on bone marrow biopsy, then LDH and alkaline phosphatase, JAK2, Calar, NPL. And then few of you pointed out BCR ABL. Yes, that's also required. Flow cytometry, I don't know well whether it will be helpful because we are not looking at a lot of karyocytes. Sorry, glass basically. So the response we were uh, looking for was reticulin stain on bone marrow. That is because we have to grade the fibrosis, whether it is a pre-fibrotic phase, where it's up to grade one or beyond, and then the molecular things. So BCR ABL has to be ruled out first and then JAK2, Calar, NPL. But on follow-up, this is the final summary of 7A, JAK2 positive pre-fibrotic primary myelofibrosis. Now coming to 7B, it's a very similar presentation. We are looking at a 60-year-old male patient splenomegaly leukocytosis but this person also has thrombocytosis so again we had very similar responses received but most of them called it et so this is the scanner view again we are looking at quite hypercellular marrow and here if we just zoom in a bit again we are looking at a hypercellular marrow and this is where et differentiates completely so usually in et the marrow is usually normal cellular and probably there is mild hypercellularity, but not as packed as how we are seeing in this particular case. And in this thing, when we look at megakaryocytes, you can see that there are a lot of variation in the size. You have a very small megakaryocyte with a hypolobated nucleus and there is a large megakaryocytes with a hyperlobated nucleus. So there is a size variation completely. And as seen in the previous case, the clustering is not so tight. It's kind of very vague or loose clustering and it's not comprising not more than five or four megakaryocytes basically. And when you look at the other pictures, other areas, there is no definitive cluster or very vague loose clustering or is what you can say. But also when you can zoom in, you have a lot of the myeloid elements, but you have a lot of small round cells which are all erythroid. So it's like all the three lineages, there is megakaryocyte increase, there is myeloid preponderance, and there's also erythroid. So all the three lineages are expanded. So coming to the findings, the summary, we are looking at a hypercellular marrow, increased megakaryocytes. So once we speak hypercellular, ET is almost ruled out. That's the only MPN which will have kind of a normal cellularity or mild hypercellularity not as hypercellular as we see in the rest, whereas it's PCV or uh, PMF cellular phase or CML, you'll get hypercellular, but whereas in ET, it won't be as cellular as it looks in these particular cases. And then you have increased megakaryocytes, and we see clustering is very loose, maximum of four megakaryocytes is what is, what is seen. And then when you come to the size, there is severe anastrocytosis. There are small hyperlobated forms to large hyperlobated forms. There are no bizarre or hyperchromatic forms as you saw in the previous case. And myeloid and erythroid both are proliferating. So based on this, the final impression we are looking for is it's a myeloproliferative neoplasm with microcyte morphology. We would favor it is polycythemia vera. And the next test recommended, it was very similar response, which was uh, uh, received. And one person actually asked for CBC and PS. That would have been good. And I think we will share it next time if we are giving. So the next test, again, in this case, reticulin stain is what we would have to see. Because if it is polycythemia vera at baseline, you need to have what is the grading of fibrosis. Because progression in fibrosis is progression of the disease in a JAK2 positive polycythemia vera. And of course, you have to rule out the BCR, ABL and rest of it. So follow-up summary was, it's a JAK2 positive polycythemia vera. So we had two cases. One was PMF 
and the other was polycythemia vera and it's always so it's just the contrasting look of the both cases whereas in the left hand side is the first case where you have a lot of tight clustering predominant myeloid whereas the right hand side you have the mega karyocytes which are increased but there are hardly any clustering but there are myeloid predominance and erythroid predominance which makes it a polycythemia vera so conclusion it's always the mega karyocyte morphology which is key for accurate typing of myeloproliferative neoplasm because in a pmf you always want to look at if circulating blasts are increasing whereas in pcv you would want to look at a lot of things like whether he is developing anemia or things like that for disease progression so just to conclude both the patients were jak2 positive the question is what will determine the different pathological process both went through so just have this question and just see if you can get an answer so for further reading just get through this pmid which is mentioned and there is this author called thiel who has done extensive work on npns it's worth reading every article of his and of course bone marrow pathology by barbara bain there is a table on which they have explained on mercury reset morphology how to differentiate between npns so just go through it thank you any questions okay someone has asked can you share reticulin pictures probably we will put it on probably i should have put that in the presentation but the first case had a grade 1 fibrosis the second one also very grade 1 fibrosis it was who mf1 fibrosis both the cases but it's just about how we follow up these patients and how different the uh, pathological process which follow though the initial presentation is almost the same any questions uh i can't see any questions anything on the youtube chat no okay uh, then we move on to the next case uh, thank you pradeep okay. who is presenting case number 80 and 80 dr padmavati okay am i audible sir yeah, yeah. yes you. good evening i'll be presenting uh, case 8 i'm dr padmavati s kamath from st john's medical college uh, so we were given two case scenarios first was that of a 35 year old male who presented with uh, fever with pancytopenia we were given bone marrow aspirate and uh, bone marrow trephine biopsy the bone marrow aspirate on low power it was uh, a particulate however it was uh, hypercellular on uh, high power we could see uh, medium to large sized atypical cells with increased nc ratio uh, nucleus had uh, condensed chromatin uh this was the trephine biopsy on low power we could see uh, interstitial and uh, diffuse uh, sheets of these atypical cells and this was the high power view uh, before i would uh, tell my final impression i think i would like to emphasize that along with the clinical history it's important to uh, correlate these findings with cbc and peripheral smears so based on as bone marrow aspirate and trephine biopsy Uh, i would like to give a final impression of lymphoproliferative disease with differential diagnosis being acute lymphoblastic leukemia and or uh, lymphoma involvement in the bone marrow uh, so uh, we were asked another question next tests to be recommended i think on uh, bone marrow aspirate i would like to do cytochemical stains of uh, mpo sbb and pas to differentiate between all and aml for uh, precursor markers i would i would like to run precursor markers on flow cytometry cd34 cd38 hla dr and tdt for b lymphoid uh, lineage uh, cd19 cd20 and cd79 a for t lymphoid markers cd3 cd5 7 uh, cd7 cd4 cd8 myeloid uh, mpo cd13 and cd33 for clonality kappa and lambda light chain assay would be helpful uh bone marrow on bone marrow biopsy i would like to run all these markers for on ihc along with markers like cyclin d1 pax5 bcl2 or uh, and bcl6 along with that mutational study is also helpful uh 
since uh, one of the differential diagnosis is uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, next case, uh, next case was that uh, was that of a 78 year old male with the pancytopenia under evaluation. Uh, sim uh, like the previous case, we were given aspirate and uh, trephine biopsy. Uh, bone marrow aspirate on low power was uh, a particulate and uh, cellular. The high power uh, showed um, small lymphocytes, uh, lymph uh, plasma cytoid lymphocytes, along with that some plasma cells. Uh, along with that, the I have marked some cells uh, with the thick blue arrows. These uh, cells seem to have a um, uh, spiky uh, cytoplasm giving ha hairy cell like uh, morphological feature uh, along with that indented nucleus is also seen in some uh, cells so this was the trephine biopsy uh, low power it uh, it showed uh, focal nodular and interstitial infiltration by these cells this is the high power here at this foci it uh, did give appearance of uh, fried egg appearance which is seen in hairy cell i feel uh, so i would i would like to give uh, my final impression i would i have three main differential diagnosis in my mind uh, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma hairy cell leukemia and hcl like disorders uh, splenic marginal zone lymphoma or uh, splenic b cell lymphoma so I would like to run uh, flow cytometry, CD19, CD20, 20, uh, CD22, CD79A, and uh, CD138 would be positive even in uh, LPL with the negative CD10, uh, 103, uh, 23. Uh, HCL would be positive for CD25, CD103, CD123, CD11, C. And for splenic marginal zone lymphoma, CD20, CD9A, and uh, CD5. Cytochemical stain like trap would be helpful in case of HCL. Kappa and lambda SA for clonality. Along with that, IHC markers like NXN1, A1, and DBF44 are helpful in case of HCL. Along with that, cytogenetic study also would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Padmavati. It was, uh, in fact, a very good, brilliant presentation. And um, you brushed up through uh, very important differentials. But um, we'll break down these two cases. I mean, one thing is very clear based on the differentials that we all of us agree that these are neoplastic cases. Yeah, because the normal elements are out and then there are there are some bad guys sitting in there and these are both neoplastic cases very simple but we just go back to the basics to understand where where do we commit and where there are times where unknowingly we even over commit two cases okay so that is the whole rationality of putting these two cases together so the answers that we received were lymphoproliferative disease yes so lymphoproliferative disease, usually we, um, you know, we are, we are looking at something like a CLL or a non hodgkins lymphoma, uh, acute myeloid leukemia and sub-leukemic leukemia. So before we go ahead, sub-leukemic leukemia, first and foremost, is not a term to be used anymore. Uh, nobody mentions sub-leukemic leukemia because whether it's either a leukemia or not, there's nothing called sub-leukemic leukemia or a leukemic leukemia. Yeah. Even though there are a few blasts in the peripherals we were in pancytopenia, when you look at the marrow, the marrow is packed. And here, when you're, when you're looking at the marrow itself that is packed, there is no uh, point in calling something a sub-leukemic sub leukemia. So we always start, like um, Dr. Padmati rightly said, that uh, we uh, she would like to look at the peripheral smear and the CBC findings. But before that, it's very important to look at the history, which we usually miss. And history gives us very key, important information, which allows us in fact narrow down to uh, you know a few specific diagnoses. First thing being fever and pancytopenia, so it's very acute and onset. Uh, so um, I mean the history which I would even like to even give you more specific history that it was a brief history of fever with pancytopenia. So you're looking at something very acute. So possibly an acute leukemia would I would favor an acute leukemia based on this history. 
So, um, like um, Dr. Rightly said, that it is a hemodilute A particulate aspirin. There were occasional particles. There was suppression of tri lineage hematopoiesis, and they were replaced by small blue round cells. Now, these small blue round cells were discrete. There was no pattern that was seen. And, um, you know, in the biopsy, also, you just saw sheets of these cells. There, were no, there was no follicular pattern. There was uh, there was diffuse infiltration not between the hematopoietic elements. You did not see few scattered interstitial cells, and these were atypical cells. So acute leukemia is favored. So you would be you ideally be ruling out a lymphoma or a, or or any sort of metastasis, and acute leukemia is favored. Now, when you're looking at when, when you look at the aspirin, you look at these cells as she rightly said that they are small cells, very scant cytoplasm, condensed chromatin and inconspicuous nucleoli. So these are blast or blastoid kind of cells. And if you look at the biopsy, it is hypercellular. There is suppression of trilineage hematopoiesis and you have sheets of these small cells which are infiltrating through the entire marrow. So uh, based on the history, I would still consider a leukemia as my first differential and an initial panel of CD10, CD34, and CD117 immature markers. If CD10 is positive, then you would want to do a CD3 or CD20 to differentiate between a myeloid or a lymphoid lineage. CD34 and CD117, what uh, they favor myeloid lineage. These are the initial markers that you put. And yes, I still agree that you can still do special stains, but it is a debate for another day how much do they contribute and how confidently you can go ahead and call it, uh, you know, a lymphoid or a myeloid neoplasm based on pure, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, special stains. Um, flow cytometry, see, sometimes you do not get the sample. You only get a pre-made aspirate and you get a bone marrow biopsy. So, uh, so, so saying flow cytometry, uh, you you can you know it is it is not it is not the right investigation of choice because you cannot do flow cytometry on a pre-made uh, aspirate or a trifine biopsy. Let us go to uh, case number eight B, which is a seventy-eight year old with pancytopenia under evaluation. Two points to be uh, you know you need to concentrate first and foremost it is an elderly person. And second thing, it is pancytopenia. Again, most likely, um, so let us look at the differentials that we received, lymphoproliferative disease, lymphoma, small blue round cell tumor, metastasis, acute leukemia. Fine, let us go uh, on the bone marrow aspirate. Yes. Okay, so on the bone marrow aspirate, it was hemodiluted, it gave a suppression of trilineous hematopoiesis and uh, like Dr. Padma uh, did, did say that there were these atypical cells, yes. So, in fact, when we uh, went through the entire slide uh, uh, and when we looked at the cells, they did look plasma cetoid. And there were some bizarre looking cells which had, there were bizarre looking cells, there were a lot of binucleate cells. And if you look at this image and if you see um, these cells carefully at the periphery, you will see there is a pinkish uh, highlighted, um, the, um, you know, uh, a pinkish highlighted outline. And few of the a few of the cells which are not highlighted in these pictures, you will always see even a perinuclear half. So these, all of these that you were seeing were plasma cells and, so, and a lot of them were binucleated and this is a multinucleated or a bizarre looking plasma cell. So in a lot of reactive processes also you do get plasma cells, you still can get binucleate plasma cells, but when you have bizarre looking plasma cells and immature plasma cells like plasma blast, they favor a neoplastic process. And we all fail to um, admire or appreciate the beautiful RBCs that are lying in the background. And if you see, um, you see that there is a roule formation. So this again is a hint that it points out towards a plasma cell neoplasm. So when you look at the bone marrow biopsy, it does mark hypercellularity. There is suppression of trilineage hematopoiesis and replaced by atypical cells. In correlation with the aspirate, you can still call these plasma cells. Now, the reason for putting this particular um, case was again to emphasize on few points and one point being that perinuclear clearing or the Friday appearance, which 
you call which you commonly see in hairy cell leukemia can also be seen in a plasma cell uh, neoplasm which is infiltrating the bone marrow that is one point uh, these were the uh, images from the trifine biopsy and this is where you see the cells which are in sheets hydrocellular marrow and then they and if you this is this is exactly the um, you know the the clearing few cells show sure. Uh, perinuclear clearing, which gives you some sort of fried clearance. And when we did a IHC of CD138, all of these cells were strongly positive. So, few of the findings in a plasma cell neoplasm, which we have not seen in this case, which you may also, which you may find, is one thing is you can see spindling of cells, which can be seen in a plasma cell neoplasm. The other thing being always extracellular immunoglobulin deposition or amyloid. These are the things also which can be seen in a plasma cell neoplasm and which you need to look out when you are suspecting a plasma cell neoplasm. Uh, further investigations, you would, uh, since if, if you're thinking on those lines of a plasma cell neoplasm, you would think of skeletal survey, total protein, protein electrophoresis, immunofixation, and IHC. Again, pro-cytometry is not an option if you do not get the marrow sample, which can be subjected to pro-cytometry for immunophenotyping. Since you have the trifene, uh, a CD138 kappa lambda would help you in this case to reach a diagnosis. Now, um, I knew this was coming and lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma is a very close differential and yes, uh, when you're looking at very few images, uh, there, you know, there are cells which look plasma cytoid, uh, but the points which are against a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma starting from history is the absence of organomegaly. Organomegaly is something which is very commonly seen in a plasma, uh, you know, like a splenomegaly which, or uh, hepatosplenomegaly, which is seen in a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. This case had absence of organomegaly. So second thing is there, was, there were no striking atypical lymphocytes that were there. Most of the cells that were seen were, uh, were plasma cells. They were bizarre looking uh, immature plasma cells that were there. And there were no atypical lymphocytes per se that were there. The third thing today, uh, Dr. Vikas did tell me this morning was he read in one of the articles in that uh, pruritus is a very common finding which is seen in LPLs, which again probably is a soft point which can help you clinically. So the take home message for this case is that it is difficult to comment on the trifine biopsy alone, whether it is a leukemia or a lymphoma. So we sometimes tend to over diagnose in this case where we call it a lymphoblastic uh, leukemia or we call it a lymphoma involvement. Just by looking at the trifine biopsy, do not commit to a neoplastic process by its lineage. Second thing being, it is important to remember that plasma cell neoplasms could mimic an acute leukemic process both clinically and on a trifine biopsy. Bone marrow aspirate definitely helps in morphological categorization and it is always better to have an IHC evidence before you commit, commit to any lineage. Okay, so since we were talking a lot about pancytopenia, I'm just going to run through the differentials with splenomegaly, uh, non neoplastic being hypersplenism, myeloproliferated neoplasm, primary myelofibrosis, lymph lymphoma, leukemia infiltration, immune cytopenias, and hemopyrocytic lymphohistiocytosis also can be one of the differentials if clinically suspected in the presence of fever. Uh, without splenomegaly, megaloblastic anemia, commonest, UK, myelodysplastic syndrome, acute leukemia, marrow failure any marrow infiltrative process like tuberculosis or metastasis and PNH. So uh, this was the discussion about these two cases. Thank you. No questions. Uh, in the interest of time, if there are any questions, uh, please do put them in the chat box. We'll move on to case number nine. Uh, Dr. Baswaraj, I hope you're okay with uh, the link being active. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Yes. Okay. The, next. the case number five uh, nine is presented by Doctor. Uh, 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 good evening, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doctor Saujanya. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what happened was it was initially allotted to uh, Raichur, yes, but uh, somebody uh, uh, due to some uh, uh, unavoidable conditions they couldn't come. So it okay. is being taken by Dr. Saujanya. She is from Alamin Medical College. She has okay. volunteered for this case. So we appreciate Great. that. 
So thank you, so thank you so much, Professor Virginia. Yeah, you go ahead and present. Yes. Uh, so is it visible, sir? My slide. Yeah, 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 yeah It's yes, fine. Yes. It's visible. Yes, sir. Uh, I have got case number nine, sir. I am Doctor Saujanya, first year PG, Alamin Medical College, sir. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, my case was uh, sixty-five year old female, anemia with leukocytosis, uh, symptomatic for weight loss, and on examination uh, there was splenomegaly. So I have got uh, four slides for this case, sir. Uh, two where uh, bone marrow biopsy and two where bone marrow aspirate were present. So the first slide was this. Your slides, uh, yeah, uh, it's yeah. moving now. Yes, sir. Uh, this was the first slide, sir. This is the bone marrow biopsy. Of, uh, bone marrow biopsy. H and D uh, stain is there, sir. So this was the magnified picture they have given. Uh, it shows abnormal localization of precursor cells and also some small sized granular precursor, uh, precursor cells are present, sir. This is hypercellular marrow. According to the age, uh, fat spaces should be more, but in this case, fat spaces are very less and cellularity is more. And uh, in the slide, some large pink color areas are present. Those were collagen deposits uh, in the previous slide. The, uh, the right side, the large pink areas were the collagen deposits. Uh, to show abnormal localization of precursor cells and also small size of granular precursors and at areas collagen deposition seen. Uh, this is hypercellular marrow. And the second slide was uh, this. So this is pearl stain uh, to highlight the ring sideroblasts. This is the pearl stain to highlight the ring sideroblasts. Uh, I didn't magnify the images, but uh, some uh, I could found the sideroblast, ring sideroblast in some areas. And next slide was this. This was also bone marrow aspirate. I magnified some cells. This is bone marrow with dysplastic feature. And this cell is pseudopagular hot anomaly or cell hyposegmentation of the neutrophil nucleus and chromatin clumping was there. This slide shows all the dysplastic features of all three lineages. Erythroid lineage showing megaloblastic change, multinuclearity, nuclear pycnosis, whereas megakaryotic lineage showing monolobar cell multiple separated nuclei and granulocytic lineage showing pseudopagular anomaly and uh, hypodegranulation. So this was the third slide and this was the last slide. This is silver implication stain method to show the reticulin on fibrosis. So this thing is the reticulin black colored. Silver impregnation stain method to show reticulin in fibrosis and some bony trabeculae is normal at some places. My diagnosis is myelodysplastic syndrome with multilineage dysplasia. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saujanya. It's great that you volunteered to present this and you've picked up most of the findings. So I'm Dr. Priya and I'll be discussing this case. Okay, so the history was a 65-year-old female who presented with anemia and leukocytosis. She's symptomatic for weight loss and on examination, there is phenomegaly. So the differential diagnosis based on this history would include acute leukemia, a myeloproliferative neoplasm, particularly uh, pre-fibrotic stage of primary myelofibrosis, or a myelodysplastic, myel uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, myeloproliferative neoplasm. Okay, so the findings on the aspirate and pearl stain. So these were the responses received. Two of them have said that it's a hypercellular marrow with dysplasia in all three lineages. Four have pointed out the dyspoiesis in erythroid and the megakaryocyte series. 
One cell is a cellular marrow with erythroblasts and myeloblasts, and one cell there were clusters of immature cells with proerythroblasts. So in pearl stain, 11 people have said that there were increased iron stores and 8 pointed out that there were ring sideroblasts. So this is the uh, bone marrow aspirate. As we can see, there are hypercellular particles with good cell trails. So this is at higher magnification. We can see the myeloid series. There is sequential maturation. We can see the mature forms. But the dispersus was not very significant. Erythroid series, there are a good number of erythrocytes and they show predominantly a normoblastic pattern of maturation. Megakaryocytes, as she has pointed out, dyspoiesis is seen in the form of nuclear hyperlobation. This is a micro megakaryocyte where we can see the high NC ratio and we can see the platelets coming out of it. Blasts were less than 5%. So this is a blast here. Okay, so this were the uh, images that were provided of the pearl stain. So these are the ring sideroblasts. So these are higher uh, magnification. So these are rings. So, so ring sideroblasts are the erythroblasts that show the iron granules, uh, at least more than five iron granules that cover more than one third of the circumference, and they were definitely more than 15%. So these can be seen in neoplastic conditions like MDS, MDS LPN, and AML, particularly AML with uh, my, uh, myelodysplastic changes. So it can be also seen in non-neoplastic conditions like alcoholism, like poisoning, copper deficiency, certain drugs like chloramphenicol and congenital sideroblastic anemia. So these were the findings on trephine. As she said, there is a hyper, uh, it's a hypercellular marrow and there were some hypolobated megakaryocytes that was seen. So this is the reticulin stain. Uh, some people have said that there was increase in reticulin, but this is actually a normal reticulin that is seen in the marrow. Okay, so the second question that was asked was, what is your final impression based on this? So these were the answers that were received. Six said that they were acute leukemia. Eleven said that they were MDS. Two said MDS MPN, of which one said that it was probably an atypical CML. Two have responded as sideroblastic anemia. Then others were CML, lymphoma, and myelofibrosis. So acute leukemia, the blasts were less than 5%, so that is not in our differential. Sideroblastic anemia, the clinical presentation and the presence of dyspoietic MEG go, in, go against that. CML would show more of granulocytic proliferation and again the dyspoietic megakaryocytes. And uh, so we are left with MDS and MDS NPA. So just to sum up our findings, there is a hypercellular marrow with megakaryocyte and erythro erythroid dyspoiesis in the form of ring sideroblasts. So going back to our history, since there is anemia, leukocytosis, and splenomegaly, there is a myelodysplastic syndrome because there is cytopenia. And since there is leukocytosis that goes in favor of a myeloproliferative neoplasm, so this is a myelodysplastic syndrome, myeloproliferative neoplasm. So MDS, MPN, this is an entity where there are overlapping features of MDS and MPN. And clinically, they manifest with various combinations of cytopenias and cytosis, just like it did in our case. So this entity now includes chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, MDS MPN with neutrophilia, it was formerly called as atypical CML. In this, there would be granulocytic hyperplasia, there would be granulocytic dyspoiesis, which is not seen in this case. Then there is MDS MPN with SF3B1 mutation and thrombocytosis. So in this, there would be ring sideroblasts. And if SF3B1 mutation was not analyzed, then if ring sideroblasts were more than 15%, it would fit in this criteria. But in our case, thrombocytosis was not seen. So the fourth uh, one in this criteria would be MDS MPN, not otherwise specified. And since we could not fit it into any of the above three, so we came to the diagnosis of MDS MPN NOS. The next question was, what are the next tests recommended? The answers received were flow cytometry or IHC, cytogenetics and molecular studies, and iron study in vitamin B12 and uh, HP electrophoresis in lines of anemia. So since we are thinking of an MDS MPN, so cytogenetics and molecular studies to assess the MDS MPN associated gene mutations, including evaluation for SF3B1, SRSF2, and TEC2 would be recommended. Questions. Any questions? Okay. Uh, 
If there are no questions, I think uh, we'll move on to the last case, uh, Professor Raj. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Dr. Arya. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just start presentation. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah you're yes. audible. Can I start, sir? Yeah, yes, start. Good afternoon, all of you. I am Dr. Arya Prakash, postgraduate, pioneer, Department of Pathology, KVG Medical College, Sulia, and I am here to present the slide seminar case number ten. So we have the we are got with the history of a sixty-year-old male with pancytopenia and splenomegaly, and we were asked for the diagnosis and what are the other tests that can be done. So and this we are uh, they given the peripheral smears and uh, and the immunophenotyping by flow cytometry it was done. Uh, it was given and coming to the interpretation so we can see a small to medium sized lymphoid cells with small oval intended kidney shaped nucleus with spongy uh, granular chromatin absent or inconspicuous nucleoli and uh, cytoplasm is abundant pale blue and shows prominent cell borders giving spider egg appearance and the circumferential hair projections and discrete vacuoles can also be seen these are the cytoplasmic vacuolations uh, so what we can see are the prominent cell borders uh, Circumferential hair like projections and vacuolations, and small to medium sized lymphoid cells with indented kidney shaped nucleus. And coming to flow cytometry, the flow cytometry dot plot shows clonal B cell population showing strong positivity for CD103, CD125, uh, CD25, and it was lambda resistant. And uh, coming to the diagnosis based on our uh, flow cytometry immunophenotyping and, uh, and the smears, we are coming to a diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia, which is a rare low grade B cell neoplasm with characteristic morphologic and immunophenotypic profile, uh, which is having a male to female ratio of 4 is to 1 and median age of 55 years. And this is to be presented with uh, cytopenias, recurrent infection, weakness, fatigue, monocytopenia, and splenomegaly. And uh, the other tests, and they were, we were asked for what are the other tests we can do. And other than CBC and peripheral smear, uh, we can um, cytogenetics and molecular analysis can be done. And molecular analysis by next generation sequencing, we can identify the BRF V600 mutation. Uh, this is because uh, this is erysa leukemia. This uh, majority is due to VRF V600 mutation, where there is uh, uh, because of this VRF 600 mutation, it uh, act, this will activate the BRA by autophosphorylation of the proteins, and there will be down regulation of ME1 or Q, ME1 and ERK path signaling pathways, and there will be increased expression of the genes involving the survival proliferation and promoting the leukemic transformation. So we can do a, a molecular analysis and find out the BRA. 600 mutation and the other routine we will do is the bone marrow aspiration and biopsy bone marrow aspiration uh, uh, it will be unsuccessful because because of increased reticulin fibrosis they will be getting a bright tab the reticulin fibers will be going to the bone marrow and uh, bone marrow and other cells here is the and uh, very cell infiltrate, so we are getting a dry tab reading uh, because of this reticulin fibrosis. And uh, in the bone, in the uh, we can the patterns we'll be getting on biopsy, uh, the interstitial and patchy diffuse pattern or solid pattern we can get, and there'll be pres with the preservation of fat and hematopoietic cells. And the leukemic cells will be widely spaced lymphoid cells and giving a honeycomb appearance. And the nucleus will be bean or oval round shaped and uh, there will be cytoplasm abundant with prominent cell borders giving a fried egg appearance. And on flow cytometry, I already told about flow cytometry. The flow cytometry, there will be uh, uh, HCL is showing high site scatter placed in the monocytic region, CD45 SSC plot. And there will be a uh, bright expression of CD20, 22 and monocytic immunoglobulin and uh, there will be a specific marker is CD123, CD103, CD25, 11C and also CD305, CD200 will be positive and it will be negative for CD5, CD23, CD10 and uh, cytochemistry uh, trap that is tartarus resistant acid phosphate is the only cytochemical stain used this is actually sensitive and but not specific and this is actually technically challenging and uh, we can see uh, with air dried smears that uh, uh, the resistant cells tartarus resistant uh, uh, cells can be seen and ihc annexin a1 it is the most specific marker for hair cells uh, it's the annexin one it is not expressed in any other b cell lymphoma other than hair cell leukemias and uh, because when we are doing 
an exin one it should be compared with the, the uh, cell antigen because it can also be expressed in myeloid cells and b cells and therefore this is not suitable for the detection of uh, uh, minimal residual disease and also we can see for uh, uh, dba44 cyclin d1 there will be cyclin d1 over expression will be there and reticulin because of reticulin fibrosis they can all reticulin also will be there and on electron microscopy we can see rod shaped inclusions these are the ribosome complexes that is we can see a cytoplasmic projections and coming to the differential diagnosis what are the differential diagnosis uh, the diagnosis can be splenic b cell lymphoma or leukemia with the prominent nucleoli this was the uh, uh, this is the hcl variant this is formerly as known as the hcl variant and uh, this is new update according to who fifth edition hematolymphoid and uh, this will be cd 11c will be bright and positive expression of cd 103 and negative for cd 25 123 200 and brf and b 600 mutation and uh, splenic marginal cell lymphoma is another DD, I will show circulating villus projection, that is uh, cytoplasmic projection is called villus lymphocyte, but it also will be negative for the markers of airy cells, 123, 103, 25, 3, uh, and anaxin, even V600, CD305, and splenic diffuse red pulp lymphoma, it is also negative for uh, the CD123, 305, anaxin, uh, or BRF, V600, cyclin D1, and others are bandle cell lymphoma, which express CD5 and so on, expression of CD1, uh, cyclin 1, and uh, negative Dr. for Dr. I think we can. I think we can just uh, uh, stop here because otherwise there will not be anything left for me to speak. Uh, so okay. it's a good presentation. Thank you. I'm sorry, yes, I have sir. to uh, uh, stop you abruptly. Is there anything more relevant to this case that you yes, want? Yes, only to this much, sir. Uh, pro lymphocytic oh, leukemia, sure. large lymphocytic leukemia, and the restrictification. These are the uh, bad prognosis. If the screenomegaly more than 3 cm, leukocytosis, hairy cells, high beta 2 microglobin, increased LDS, it will be a bad prognosis, sir. And no. uh, these are my references, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. You've uh, Thanks, more or less covered everything that I also wanted to discuss. So I'll just quickly focus only on. Uh, can you please stop sharing your screen so uh, that okay, I share mine? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this was the history given. Okay, a sixty-year-old uh, gentleman with pancytopenia, splenomegaly. Uh, this was the whole list of uh, differential diagnosis we received. It was a fairly straightforward case and almost uh, most of the responses we got was for hairy cell leukemia, which is the right diagnosis. Uh, one point I would like to highlight is you described these as small to medium sized cells. Um, if I take the RPC as a point of reference, I would probably call these as medium to large sized cells. That is just one point. The rest of the description is fine. Uh, here you can see that these are 19 positive cells which are showing a slightly higher side scatter than lymphocytes. Usually hairy cell leukemia cells will fall here. Um, apart from that, like you rightly, uh, rightly said, they are positive for, uh, sorry, they are negative for CD5 and CD10 and are positive for 123, 103, 25 and 11C. So that confirms the diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia. Uh, the only other soft point I would like to mention is rather than saying lambda resistant, you would uh, I would prefer Kappa. to say Kappa restricted or Kappa clonal because Kappa is what is expressed, not lambda. Uh, it's not that these cells are resistant to lambda. Uh, so just to summarize, all, all the points that you mentioned are here which lead us to a diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia. And also, like you rightly said, we need to do a BRAF B600E for confirmation. Uh, NX in A1, uh, from what I've seen so far, I, I, I don't remember anyone doing that marker. It's there in the textbooks. Very few people probably have it. Uh, I don't know how about its clinical utility because I've never used it. But it's I think we've gone beyond that to a BRAF mutation because um, I don't think any other lymphoma expresses BRAF E600E. And when it's a 5 negative, 10 negative B cell lymphoma, BRAF E600E more or less is specific for a hairy cell leukemia. Um, so, the, the differential diagnosis we received was one was hairy cell leukemia variant. Like you rightly said, these patients present with leukocytosis and in the latest WHO, this entity doesn't exist. The disease exists, but it's called something else. It's called as clinic B cell lymphoma. The second common uh, differential we got was pro lymphocytic leukemia. Now, again, I think till we see uh, what pro lymphocytes are, we try to imagine what pro lymphocytes can look like. Just for the benefit of everyone here, this is what a typical pro-lymphocyte should look like. The prominence of the nucleolus should be like this. So if a, new, if a cell has a nucleolus like this, we call it a pro-lymphocyte. If it's a nucleolus that we need to imagine, then it's most likely not a pro-lymphocyte. 
even now those pro lymphocytic leukemias are also reclassified under this broad category of splenic b cell lymphoma and prominent nuclei uh, the other differentials were cml all l3 aml again cml probably because it was splenomegaly but then there were no myeloid markers which were positive so i wouldn't even entertain this diagnosis uh, all l3 morphologically these didn't look like plas so l3 is again from the fab classification or the era i wouldn't entertain this diagnosis aml mixed phenotype and plasma cell also based on the phenotypic evidence which was given uh, would not really be considered as a true differentials in this case uh, so just to wrap it up you did a wonderful job with the uh, Thank you, sir. presentation and with uh, presenting your findings uh, to everyone here thank you for uh, a wonderful set of presentations we've had a great time a lot of learning from both sides if i know we've kind of had a uh, little less time today to discuss but if there are any questions or queries about any of these cases that you have not had a chance to ask uh, please do drop in a mail to either me or dr ramya uh, we will try to uh, get back to you with uh, suitable explanations uh, or we can plan another session if you want uh, dr basaraj thank you and the entire kci kci ipm team for giving us this opportunity and for uh, really doing a great job with the uh, online hosting uh um, dr jairam if you're online any words yeah uh thank you dr baswaraj and the entire uh, kci pm team thank you sir for giving us this opportunity and uh, for various reasons it had i think what was slated a few weeks ago got pushed and uh, finally i think uh, end of it we've done a wonderful job I must congratulate each and every one of the young presenters who have actually put in a lot of effort to analyze and look at these uh, online images and looking at smears, which are uh, whole slide images, I think is a challenge. Histopathology, we are a lot more familiar. The peripheral smears, which are bone marrow smears, which uh, were their virtual images, of course, it was supported with the uh, other uh, images that have been shared. So that is a challenge, but uh, I must admit uh, uh, the team has done a wonderful job. Each of these uh, 10 postgraduates have done a wonderful job. And I also thank my, I thank each one of you. I thank my entire team for the efforts they have put in. And uh, end of it, I think the discussion was very learning, especially for me, it has been a learning experience. So uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anand Vikas. It was a wonderful session. And thank you all the participants for a uh, nice discussion over the cases. Uh, looking ahead with the next slide seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Can we leave the meeting, Dr. Basraj? Yes, sir, you can. Thank yes, you. sir. I'll close the session.